Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second artist, uh, Zoom artist interview. Tonight we'll be talking with uh, Noah Williams, who's one of our solo artists whose um, work, whose show, Ancestral Callings, is, up, is currently up. Mixed media artist Noah Williams celebrates the power and energy of African mask making traditions in his solo exhibit, Ancestral Callings, on view in Studio 5 on the first floor of the Torpedo Factory, now through September 10th, I mean, now through October 4th. Williams' masks are created with found materials, both organic and man-made. The faces of his sculptures are exceptionally expressive, ranging from fierce to sly, from warriors to tricksters, sharpened teeth or sharpened wit. The artist remarked that working with items that used to contain life, such as cowrie shells, leather, fur, animal bone, and feathers has spiritual significance and imbues the mask with sacred vitality. Measuring nearly four feet high and festooned in copper wire and sapphire aluminum, Illusions, one of his larger works, has a regal presence, holding court as effortly as Shuja, a mask whose immense real-life bullhorns are, are an exhilarating spectacle. And we'll see and talk about some of those masks that I mentioned. And now I'd like to welcome Noah Williams. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Noah. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I, I want to uh, get into the questions now. First, I wanted to ask, how long have you been an Art League artist member? Um, I think I started showing my artwork down there um, maybe around the early 2000s. I can't remember the exact year, but it was definitely the early 2000s. And were they always masks? No, no, I was painting and uh, I had some sculptures too, but they were more my earlier uh, pieces when I was using more larger materials and stuff like that. When did you know that you were an artist? Uh, I believe I knew I at a very young age, at a very young age. I think I was probably around five or six or something like that. I knew, I knew I always had a love for it. And what kinds of things did you create at that tender age? More just drawing on tables and walls and just drawing on everything and getting in trouble at school and, you know, just doodling on everything, everything. When we spoke um, last week, you talked about some of your early um, art inspirations at that age. Um, could you tell us what they were, tell everybody what they were. I know you said graffiti and... Yeah, I was, I was definitely uh, at a very young, I, I remember uh, specifically uh, at a very young age, I, my mother had, uh, would always go to the bookstores and there was a section in there I, I came across, it was uh, something with like New York graffiti. And I remember just opening the book and it just being <laughs> so amazed of just, you know, just the art and the freedom that it was. And I, I, I remember, like, I always wanted to do graffiti art after that, like, but, um, but yeah, it, it, uh, it, it, it definitely influenced me too. And I was into comic books too, at a young age too. Yeah, you mentioned the series Brother Man, um, Dictator of Discipline comic books yeah. by Dawood Anyabwele and his brother Guy Sims out of Philadelphia. Talk a little bit about those comic books I they meant for you. That, uh, like I said, I always collected comic books, but that particular book, my, my Aunt Vivian, may she rest in peace, she, the one, she's the one who put me on to it. And I just remember just reading it over and over again, because I loved the, his style of art, how he drew his characters. It was just different. And plus, it was just a, it was a, a Black character. So, you know, coming up, the, I don't remember any Black characters that really, you know, that stood out. But this particular character, you know, I just, it just amazed me how his drawing, and I remember trying to practice and copy his, his style and stuff like that. And, you know, he was uh, heavily into graffiti too, you could see in his style and stuff. So I just remember like just loving his work as a young right. child. Right. I read uh, that his work is now in the um, National, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Yeah, he's an amazing. The comic books. Describe your artistry. How would you describe what you do? 
Um, I like to to say it's something that's different. I'm always trying to push myself to to separate myself from the masses. You know, I want to do something that uh, you know that I've never seen before, something that uh, somebody else has never seen before. I just I just um, I just want to create art that is that's going to make you stop in your tracks. Mm -hmm. And how did you come to make art with found objects? Um, at a young, well, and like again in the early two thousands, I, like I said, I love to paint, but uh, you know, paints can be expensive at the and at that time, um, you know, I just wasn't able to afford a lot of the paints that I wanted to get. And as we discussed, I uh, came across a book where it was uh, some kids in Africa that were creating art out of uh, discarded items. Plus, I forgot to mention, I used to do ceramics. So I used to, I kind of started out working with clay and I remember making masks uh, when I did do that. Freehand clay, not the, uh, the wheel, but uh, it kind of evolved from clay to metal. But the book definitely influenced me when I saw the kids that were, uh, they were creating the art with, um, you know, soda cans and stuff like that. They were making birds. And I figured I was, you know, I can do that. There's an abundance of trash out here. So I can always, you know, play around. And it's just, it's funny to look back at, at my really earlier phase of doing sculptures. And it was, it was very clunky and, you know, big and stuff like that. So it's just, it's funny to look back and then it's like, I see where I've evolved to now, like the maturity and the growth with it and the use of different materials and certain materials that I don't need anymore. And you've been a mixed media artist for about 20 years now, right? Maybe a little older, a little longer. How, so you said things used to be a little clunky before. I was very interested in knowing how you go about collecting objects and materials for your art. But the earlier years, I would uh, dumpster dive. I would always like, you know, if a house was being un, you know, under construction, this is when like you used to be able to find like copper piping, like, you know, you could jump in the dumps and, and I'd have like a whole yarn of it. But uh, now, you know, it's almost impossible to find copper now. But uh, back then, that's when I did that. And then, you know, I would have people donate stuff as well. You just put out a call to people and say, hey, if you're getting rid of junk. Um, I can't remember how it came out, but I just remember I had to stop that call because people were just dumping their junk off on me. And I was like, I'm, I, it was kind of after my first show. Mm -hmm. And um, how has your hunt changed through the years? Um, uh, you know, a lot of the materials that I used to use, I don't need anymore because like I said, it's just, it's too heavy. Um, I like to work with metal that I can manipulate and uh, that I can form shapes. I still collect a lot of soda cans and I, you know, I'll beat those down, but I, I like to use other materials as well. I like to switch it up that I'm not just using one set of materials. So I use like leather, fabrics, uh, screening, um, just uh, materials that I could cut up or punch holes in. You know, you use, if you use things like soda cans or other commercial types of materials, in the period of time that you've been doing mixed media art from found objects, do you find that the quality of some of these things change over time? Like, are soda cans lighter now? Or, I don't know, just it, anything it, that... Not, 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 not necessarily, but it's... it's uh, the soda cans are more for the patterns and the colors. Okay. Not necessarily a specific brand. And that goes to with a lot of the materials that I collect. I, I'm thinking about patterns, shapes, and colors. And it just happens to be that material that I'm using. I see. So what do you use to um, set the shape of your mask when you begin? Um, I, could, I could use either uh, like copper wire or what I'm using now is uh, banning material. What they use to ban uh, signs on telephone poles and stuff like that. Because so, it's, it's so easy for me to manipulate and I can form structures and stuff like that or like uh, depending on what it is that I'm trying to create. It's just it's very easy for me to manipulate that metal. And if I make a mistake and I, I can always kind of like, you know, fold it back to wherever I needed to go. Now, you've told us that you are obsessed with detail, and that comes across in some of the smaller objects that you use. Do you want to talk about those things like keys and bullet casings? And it, it goes back to, you know, like the patterns and details, and it just so happens that some of those patterns and details wind up being smaller objects. But uh, I, I, 
I want to create art that, you know, when people, they, they have to stare at everything that's going on, that there's so much going, that they have to continue to like, oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't see that. You know what I mean? I, I'm trying to create art that that's going to like have that flash in your memory that you always revisit. Like with certain other artists with me that, that I, all, I see the work and it just blows me away that I'm just, I have this relationship with this, this piece of work now that every time I visit, it, it gives me some type of happiness to see it because I see the passion with that particular artist. So it goes the same with me. Um, you know, I want I want people to see the passion. So of course that goes into with the obsession with the detail because you know it just sometimes it's hard. I have to tell myself to stop. <laughs> like okay, this piece is done. Like move on to the next one. Yes, if you haven't seen Noah's work yet, um, I can attest to the detail and also it's kind. Of, his works are pieces that every time you come back and look at them, you see something different or something you didn't notice before. So that's, that's really interesting. It makes your work very special. Um, what was your inspiration for Ancestral Callings? Ancestral call, Callings came to me more, um, I came up with that title uh, because of, of my, when creating my mask, I feel like there's, there's this energy that comes with it. And that energy, ha you know, is Africa. That, that's where the influence comes from. Um, even with, uh, you know, with my paintings, it, it's definitely, you know, related towards that, but I feel like more with my, the mass and the energy that comes with that is definitely African influence. So I feel like it's my ancestors calling me. And that's why I came up with the title for that. It's like they're, they're coming through me to the mass. Okay. I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please type them in the chat section of our Zoom meeting and um, we'll get to questions um, after we look at some of um, Noah's work. I selected some of um, the mass, um, a few masks that I want you to speak about specifically. So um, they're coming up on a slide. Noah? Yes. This is illusions. Okay. Yes. yes. Please talk about this. Tell us about the materials. And um, this is your piece that's your really large piece, correct? Yeah, that's about four feet. Okay. So, so th this particular piece, um, I'd, I'd like to say it was about five years ago when I started it. Um, maybe, maybe about four years ago. But uh, you know, I started out, the frame was, I remember, was uh, copper, um, thin kind of copper, and I was able to, uh, you know, manipulate it to the, to the shape. But I built the skeleton um, with, with a whole concept that's not what you see right now. Uh, the vision was completely different when I, I like, originally started on this. Uh, this particular piece took me about eight, nine months to do because I was, I was so frustrated with how it just wasn't, it didn't flow with me. And, you know, I would work on it, then I'd have to set it to the side. I would I'd add pieces, then I would have to take stuff off. But um, it, it was a period where it just really, like towards the end of it, it started really coming along. And then that's where the vision really started coming in. And I felt that, uh, that it, uh, it came into place, but man, it gave me trouble working on this one. This was, this was a love-hate relationship with this particular project right here, but I, I'm, I'm satisfied with the outcome, but getting to that point was a struggle. And you say you began it five years ago? Yeah, well, I built a skeleton. A lot of times I'll build uh, a lot of skeletons, I'll have the idea. So mm -hmm. I'll have skeletons on standby, so I'll, I'll probably try to work on two projects at the same time. But I'll, I'll, if I have an idea, I'll construct the skeleton and wire it up, but then I'll come back to that particular project later. Okay. This one, um, I had to redo the lips completely. Uh, the lips were a complete different color, fabric, material, but I, it just, I hated it. So I had to take the lips off and redo everything. But uh, the, what the material is now, it was, it's a pair of ripped jeans that I uh, sliced real thin and wrapped wire around it. And then I created the, made it like circles, just, just for the pattern of the circle in the 
kind of like the rip in the in the jean and everything like that. Oh, so that's what the lips are made of. Yeah, rib jeans. Wow. And the the face, like around the cheeks, under the eyes, those are soda cans. It looks like Red Bull cans. Yeah, those are Red Bull cans, and that, it has nothing to do with Red Bull. I just like the color of that blue. Right. Right. Kind of like the pattern and the shapes within the soda can. Right. Okay. Move on to the next one. So this, this particular piece, um, I did this one a while ago too. This is uh, one of my favorite, was one of my favorite pieces, but these are actual uh, gazelle horns um, that I was able to come across. And uh, in the middle section is uh, my hair. Like when my, as my hair grew, like pieces of my, my dreads would break off. So I would always just kept a little bag of all my hair and just, just for different materials to, you know, just something different to, to have add a little bit more energy and power to that piece. Mm -hmm. Do you have a name for this piece? Uh, this particular piece is called uh, Kakua, and this is uh, from the Yoruba. And I picked that name because I felt like it's, uh, it's, it's, to me, it's, it, 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 it's a, a firm, kind of a firm piece, and it kind of shows like a little bit of seriousness so I, 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 with a lot of the titles of my pieces, I like to try to pick uh, different African deities. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are more, you know, warrioristic. Um, like this particular one, um, I, I believe it's uh, based out of Nigeria, but uh, it was, he was known for to be, to be one of the most feared warrior spirits. So, you know, you get to see the, the kind of the, the glare and like his lip is kind of out, like, you know, he's ready for combat. So that was kind of like the idea with this particular piece. Where did you get gazelle horns? Um, my mother had a friend that used to go to uh, Africa and would bring back certain materials. So I, I was blessed to come across. I wish I could come across some more of these. But uh, yeah, I, I came up on those. That was a good one. OK. All right. So, um, okay. so we're going to go to the next one. Okay, what's the name of this one? Uh, this, is, this is reminiscent. Go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm trying to find it. I had everything written down. Uh, well, I, I'll start out with the structure. The, the, with the structure of the head with this particular piece, um, it was a uh, drum. It was somebody, I guess somebody was throwing away uh, like the the clamps for the drums for the big like toxic drums or something like to give you an idea the big so like, had, drums yeah something okay. like that yeah but i, I um i kind of squished it down i didn't want it to be like a circle but i kind of squished it down and then i uh, built the structure of the face but the this particular piece was definitely influenced with uh it's like the congolese uh region where they would uh, particularly uh, have the witch doctors um, with their sculptures and it would be uh, like nails, but it was, it was something towards the enemies of you know, the people that they were, wanted to send evil spirits. So that's the influence. I don't have the name of it in front of me right at the moment, but uh, that's- I do, I do. It's called Nkisi Nkandi. Yes, here it is. They it. would drive nails and- But it was, nails it was, it was, it was by, like the nail fetish. Right. This particular piece gave me some trouble too, because it was it was used. I used screen, so I could like to be able to sew the the wire in. But it, like I cut my hands up big time on this particular piece. But uh, I, I definitely enjoy putting it together. I, uh, this was a even though I, like my hands took punishment, but I particularly liked enjoyed this particular piece while I was working on it though. About how many nails did you use for this? Do you <laughs> my whole my whole supply. My whole supply of nails that I had stored, but what I what I did was, uh, if you can see, kind of like the the color, the upper part is a little bit more rusted. Um, I had to purchase more nails, but I tried to rust out the other nails, but it wasn't rusting fast enough. So, I, I felt like it came it came out together, like the contrast. But if I had it my way, it, everything would have been the same, like color structure. But I, I think it it came out okay with how it did. But and how I, did you, how did you, 
did you hammer the nails in or are they attached? So, so what I did, the process with this particular piece, uh, they're hammered into wood blocks. So what I did was I um, painted all the wood blocks black and then I put uh, polyurethane on it uh, to give it a shine so the, the black paint won't chip or anything like that. Then I started hammering. I would hammer everything in first. And uh, I, what I came across with this particular piece, a lot of the wood would just split uh, from the nails. So I had to kind of be careful with the, the hammering the nails in, but it was just a repetitive, just hammering nails. Oh, this was another kind of like an obsessive type piece. You know, we're just hammering the nails over, and I wanted to flood. I wanted like it flooded with nails. Well, you did just that. <laughs> <laughs> it is full of nails. Okay. So this particular piece. Uh, Chuja. Yes, I, I had uh, this. This piece. This was what a fun project for me. Um, like when I came up on the bullhorns. Uh, a buddy of mine was cleaning out uh, somebody's shed and he called me and he was like, hey man, I got these horns for you. And when I came across these horns, I, uh, like almost instantly I knew what, how this project was gonna turn out. You know, the vision was there, like maybe not necessarily everything that you see on it now, but it, it was very similar. And it was, I was just so excited to have these massive bull horns and to be able to add it onto a mask. It really, uh, it, I had fun with this particular project and it just, everything just worked out perfect, excuse me, perfect with it and uh, just everything. And just, it, it's one of my favorite pieces right now. So this piece, there are horns, there are nails. Is this leather that is woven into the face? So uh, it's different. Uh, this pre-COVID, I used to drive around looking for leather couches. Like people would throw their couches away. Mm -hmm. And I always kept a knife on me, so if I see the couch, I could just cut all the leather right out the couch. But now I'm kind of like hesitant now, like, you know, I saw a couch earlier today and I was like, eh. like I wanted to go for it, but I was like, ah, I'm not going to fool with this one. But um, yeah, that that's actually all that leather is from a couch that I use. But I, I, I started out with just the, the dark brown and the light brown and the cloth is a, a dinker cloth. Mm -hmm. that I, I was able to to use and uh, stretch out around the eyes. I felt like the pattern and everything just, it just, everything was just, it flowed perfect with that. And then uh, the buffalo teeth too, just to kind of give it that even more, you know, umph to it. What are some of the strangest or most unique uh, items that you found and used? Um. One particular item I wish I can get my hands on again. It was uh, some uh, python skin that I was able to get from Panama. I didn't get it from the, the person that they got it from, but it was a witch doctor that gave it to an individual. And I had this big roll of, uh, you know, the, the skin. I wish I could come across, like items like that. That's what I get excited over. You know, just rare, hard to find items. That's why I was so excited about the bullhorns because I'm, that's such a rare find. And like I said, when, it, when I find these like rare items like that, it's like the, the idea sometimes it comes instantly because it's like, I want to like put it to use. How, how easy are teeth to find? Uh, well, the teeth, like originally I was looking for horse teeth because uh, I, like, I like how the horse teeth are like, just big and kind of like scary looking. And then I found uh, the buffalo teeth and what made it even easier, they had the holes already drilled into it. So like I kind of stitched uh, everything together with the teeth. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's just something to give it a little bit more power and a little bit more energy and a little bit more flair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell us about this one. This is another one of one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this one, I, I built the skeleton a, like way back, uh, maybe about three years ago. But like I said, I, I always build skeletons for future projects. So like I might, I'll create it and then I just set it aside when I'm working on a bigger project or I might have other projects going on. Uh, I originally didn't know what direction I wanted to go with this piece when I had when it was just a skeleton form 
But uh, once I started playing around with it, I had an idea where, like, I just wanted to do nothing but Kyrie shows, just just trying something different. And then it just, everything just flowed perfectly. And I wanted the, the teeth, uh, even though the bullets, but it's kind of more like, I wanted to, like, kind of like a flashiness, like gold teeth, like you're showing off your teeth, you know. But uh, it, they just, ha I like just like the, the color of the, uh, the brass, like the bullet shells. Mm -hmm. It's like patterns too. It's, it's still kind of like it has nothing to do with the bullet itself, but it's like the pattern and the shape that comes with it. Do you um, sketch out your ideas before you begin working on a mask? Some do. Some some of them uh, I do. I uh, I kind of played around with the the one with the bullhorns. That particular piece I kind of played around with it, uh, sketched it out. Um, a lot of times I don't. Uh, sometimes I I'll get the vision. And then I have to get the the banner material, and that's kind of like my sketch. Like I'll get the I have the idea, and then I just get the banner material, and then I start forming it and forming, it, and then I build the skeleton, and then you know I start adding the wire to 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 create that first the very first layer before I start building up the the other materials. On this particular mask, what is what is the beading at the crown of I mean at the top of the head? Um, that is just uh, one of those Mardi Gras beads. Okay. But it was gold. I like the gold because the mm -hmm. gold pops. And the the gold that's surrounding it, um, and this is what I talk about when I like kind of evolving with the, the art. I use a lot of fabric now. And what I'll do is I'll, wrap the, I'll cut shreds of the fabric and I'll wrap, wrap wire around it. Like, like, I don't even know how much wire, like it's a bunch of wire to like, stretch it out but it gives it color and it uh, i could use a whole bunch of it to like build up you know build up but it's more for like the color and the patterns and stuff like that okay we'll go to the next slide okay and this i see you have feathers what type of feathers are these uh you know honestly i those are turkey feathers yeah tur well i guess they're, they're turkey feathers but somebody gave me uh a whole bag full of feathers. That was in the, the period I was receiving uh, junk before I cut people off. <laughs> so that was that was cool to get like a whole thing of feathers right there. So I got I still got a bunch of feathers that I'm like for future projects that I'm gonna be using that tell I got us, from that. What tell tell us what this mask signifies for you? Um to me it was just I at the time, I kind of like, I didn't really have a direction with this, but when I first started it, uh, I didn't particularly like where it was going. Um, I added the feathers later on, but when the feathers uh, came with it, like when I added them, I kind of felt more of like, a, kind of like a, a, a carnival kind of feeling uh, with that one, uh, kind of like a, a celebratory type of thing. But in the beginning of this particular project, I, it was kind of one of those things I was like, I was working on it, but I wasn't feeling it. But then I'd work on it again. And uh, then, you know, it came out how I thought it came out pretty good. And I'm going to go back to the subject of teeth. Several people have asked where you get buffalo teeth, how you acquired them. And are these <laughs> buffalo teeth, teeth on this mask? Uh, these are coyote bones. Ah. Okay, so people are going to ask, where do you get buffalo teeth and where do you get coyote bones? I, I order them online. I'm always online looking for weird stuff to, uh, to buy. There, there's a market for these things? Yes, I've actually even seen human bones, but I'm not fooling with human bones. Okay. I'll pass on that. One, one, one person asked um, or commented that the faces of your mask are so unique. Are any of the faces based on someone you've met? even in a small way, like eye color? Mm, not necessarily. Um, I feel like each mask has its own energy and its own spirit that visits me at the time. That's why like some of them, like this particular one, I wouldn't consider this uh, a, a fierce kind of look. I feel like this is more of a kind of like a, like I said, a celebratory type of thing. But, um, it, you know, I feel like it, it comes and goes with the, if I'm working on multiple pieces, but, um, you know, some are like a little bit more harsh. It, it all it all depends on the energy that comes with that one, that particular piece that I'm working on. And someone commented that shark teeth would be cool. So 
I actually have a uh, shark tape that I'm gonna use in a fish project that I'm uh, working on right now. Okay, okay. So um, I'm kind of, kind of excited to see how that's gonna turn out. Are, is, is one type of bone or teeth easier to work with than others? Or you mentioned that the coyote teeth, I mean, not the coyote, the buffalo teeth had holes in them for threading. So those were easy. Do they all come with holes in them? No. Oh. No, these I had to, I think I used wire. I'm, I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think I did use wire. Uh, if they, if I'm not able to like, um, they have a hole for me to, to stitch it through. I usually just kind of like make my own little connection with wire and uh, go from there with it. You've mentioned the spiritual, cultural and emotional aspect of your work. Have you ever made political statements in your work? Um, not so much. I mean, not to say that that can't happen in the future with some future projects. Um, right now, my focus has just been with the, the mass. Um, but uh, as of lately, no, I have not been doing any type of political art or anything like that. And do you have a particular, like you say you used to dumpster dive. Now, I imagine you get a lot of things online, but do you have particular areas or places that you'd like to go to find things? And you don't have to give like the specifics. Uh, you don't have to give us any specifics, sorry. I have, a, I have a keen eye for junk. So, you know, I, I could be jogging or I'm driving and I see something I decide it's it's crazy how I'm able to find some of these things but I see things up the side of my eye and I was like look let me go ahead and make a pit stop and pick this up real quick and uh, I'll throw it in the trunk or I, I you know put it in my pocket depending on what the situation is but uh I pulled over I bust u-turns sometimes to get materials that I've seen like in the middle of an intersection in the island or something like that I'll pull off on the side and like I'm running out there to get it real quick. <laughs> Do people ever ask you what you're doing, what you're up to? <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take for you to complete all of the mask for this exhibit? I've been working on this show. So a lot of the pieces, some of the pieces are were existing pieces, but uh, out of that, the newer pieces, it was probably about nine pieces. So little over a year to produce uh, pieces that I felt were worthy, you know, to display. Do you work on art every day, Noah? I try to make it a point. If I don't, I feel like I haven't, like I'm, I feel like I'm, uh, it's like I'm being lazy or something like that. I, like, it's a weird feeling that I get when I, like when I set a goal to work and I, I'm not able to work, it's, uh, it's an internal, like frustration and like I get so disappointed in myself that like I have to I have to do something mm -hmm. e whether like I've getting I've been getting back into my drawing just just drawing in my sketchbook but just something artistic I have to be doing every day how is your studio set up do you have like when you fashion these masks when you make these masks do you use some kind of um form to put them on or is there it's primitive. <laughs> I just, I, I have either, I've set it up on the side of a chair and I got two big wood blocks that okay. I just set them on and I could, depending on the size of the mask, I'll just set it in and I just kind of use that as my base. But uh, a lot of times I'm just working on a, a bucket with a pillow on it and two wood blocks and my, my little hammer and my other little primitive tools that I'm using. And how do you how do you store your things? How do you do you have like drawers of? All I've, of your actually, I've actually gotten a lot better with organizing materials. Uh, my mother used to fuss at me all the time to organize, and and, and since I've done that, it, it's a lot easier to uh, you know just find certain things because before it was just a little scattered. But uh, I feel like I've even with that I've been matured, and like I said, a lot of materials that I don't big bulky materials I don't need anymore. So just, it's like smaller things that I keep. Like beer, ca I, 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 beer caps, wine corks, um, carriage shells, I can never have enough of those. Keys, if I can have those to last forever, I, I would. What is something that you would like that you haven't used yet? 
Hmm. That's a good one. I don't know. Maybe some type of uh, bones from an animal that I haven't been able to get my hands on. You know, something big, something different. Maybe mm -hmm. some like rib cages or something like that. This I don't know. It might be kind of creepy to some people, but like just something with uh, you know animal bones that's rare to come by, mm -hmm. and and different snake skins and stuff. You mentioned. Um... Well, you didn't mention specific artists, but you talked about artists, you like artists whose work you kind of come back to continuously and you see things in them, or they have a certain energy. What artists do you feel a thematic or visual kinship with? Um, I wrote a couple down because I have, I have a few, but I would say that the top on the list is uh, Diego Rivera's. I, I look at his work and it just, it blows me away, man. It just, I, I could sometimes just look at his work and just stare at it for hours, you know, hours. Just looking at, you know, just the creativity and just, it, it's just fascinating to see somebody that has, you know, that, that mindset to, to accomplish something of that magnitude and for it to be so powerful in drawing at the same time. Uh, it's another artist named uh, Alex Gray that I particularly, uh, I like him. Uh, he does a lot. He's big paintings. I actually got to see his work at the uh, Visionary Art Museum. Amazing. Amazing work. It blew my, it just blew my mind. Uh, another artist, uh, Faith uh, Rengold, mm -hmm. uh, Basquiat, and it was a local artist uh, named Big Al. I loved his work too. Tell us about Big Al's work. What does it look like? Um, he... it, it's, it's abstract, but just his style was amazing. I remember when I used to work at uh, part-time at uh, Pearl Arts and Craft, he used to come in there and buy supplies. And I'd be like, Big Al, what's up, Big Al? Like, you know, what's going on? And he'd be like, oh, uh, uh, you, know, you know, and I would talk to him about artists and stuff. And he'd be like, oh, he sucks or whatever. You know what I mean? But it was just, he had so much personality. But his work, it was just amazing. His work was amazing. Someone asked, what sub-traits have you used for Matt, for your mask, and which ones work best for you? What, say that again? It looks like it says... Base? Yeah, base. Well, it's just, it's just uh, like the structure, like I said, is like the banner material. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll create the, the, the structure of the face, and then I use the the... Like I said, all right, from the beginning, I'll create the shape of the face. So it's like an oval, like a circle, like you're drawing, you draw the circle or whatever. But then I'll, I'll build the bridge of the nose. So that's the second move. Like I'll form the forehead, uh, the nose, if, I, if, the, if, you know, the mouth, the, the chin area and stuff like that. Then I'll start to like build uh, around and then I'll run wire in between. So that builds like the skeleton. But then everything else is just me layering on top. So like the final thing will be like the mouth and the eyes and stuff like that. But I'll usually, uh, once I get the, the base of the material down, I'll build the structure of the eye and then I'll build around the eye. I made mistakes where uh, I built uh, certain pieces before certain other uh, things and I would have to take it off. And I'm like, man, it's too much work trying to take, I gotta cut all the wire that I ran through there. So. I kind of got a system. I got a system down where I'm not, you know, making work harder for myself when it comes to that. Is there any material that you have stored up that you haven't used yet? Um, I believe I've touched everything that I got stored, some one way or another. Uh huh. Let's see. Would you consider yourself a folk artist? I guess in a way. Tell us how so. I mean, I guess just off of the materials that I use, uh, you know, I'm I'm not using, uh, you know, your your traditional materials, you know, and I never had any like formal training, and building and working with metal and stuff like that. If you could place one of your masks anywhere, publicly for it to be viewed, where would you? Place. Uh, and which one or you can describe I, there's a couple of places I would like uh, I would definitely love 
one of these days to be able to display my work at a visionary art museum. That's one of my favorite museums, just off of the, the caliber of artists that they, dis, they display there because it's so different and so unique. Um, and that's why I was able to see the artist, uh, Alex Gray, see his paintings and, and uh, things that he built. Uh, it, some of them were just paintings, but some of the stuff he built were like structures into the paintings. It was just, it was just, it just blew my mind seeing it, man. And just the level of uh, detail. But yeah, that's one of the museums I would definitely love to display my work. Um, the African American Museum in uh, DC and uh, the Brooklyn uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. I want to get up in there. Someone asks, do you use any power tools during your process? Um, when I'm working with shells, I have to use a, a drill but I have to have a, a special drill bit that I, uh, for the, to, uh, to drill into the seashells. And do you, That's about it, and what about glues or epoxies to adhere? There is a uh, certain glue that I use um, for uh, certain areas. Like if I'm like with the eyes, sometimes I'll use the glue to like kind of build up. So mm -hmm. that's why you'll see kind of like the different layers but I use it for not like big areas, but I use it for like smaller detail areas and stuff like that. And has the concept of your show changed since you submitted your proposal for this show? No, no, it's still the same. Still the same. Yeah. And how would you advise fellow artists to prepare for a solo exhibit like the one you're in now? Ooh, I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time that you're going to have to invest. And, you know, it's not about just creating art. It's creating the best art that you can create. Create the best art that you can possibly create. Every time I create a piece, I want to make it better than the last piece. So, you know, it's not about abundance. It's about quality. What's next for you? What are you working on now? Um, I got a couple of ideas. Um, kind of playing around with some things. I'm trying to, like I said, I, I, I'm at a point in my life that I want to evolve. I want to to grow and continue to grow with my art. So I'm just I'm just trying some different things. I'm still going to be doing sculptures and stuff. Uh, like I said, I, I love to paint. So I'm trying to find a way that I could uh, implement my paintings into my sculptures as well, mm -hmm. just to take it to another level of just creati creativity within myself. So I'm still trying to play around with that. I haven't uh, done anything as of yet. I have a couple of uh, skeletons that I've, I've built, um, just kind of playing around with, seeing what direction those go. Um, but we'll see. What has this period of, um, this pandemic period been like for you? Has it affected your work or how you work, your process in any way? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, you, when you're working, you're working. It shouldn't matter what's going on outside. When you're in, in your own particular zone, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be a war going on outside. You know, you focus on what you're doing. Um, I remember uh, when everything shut down, I was kind of blown that, you know, back in April, you know, I wanted to have the show. But I feel like everything happens for, you know, when it's supposed to happen. So, you know, this was the time that it was supposed to happen. And they gave me an opportunity to produce a couple of more pieces and uh you know have some of the pieces that that are currently on display now so it it worked out and when is your next show i think right now i'm not going to particularly focus on any shows i just want to produce some good art mm -hmm. i want to produce some art uh that's different um like i said i I'm, I'm just i'm trying to evolve and grow so i'm gonna push myself i'm definitely going to challenge myself with the future pieces and uh, I have some ideas. I got some stuff cooking in the kitchen right now. Okay. Do you ever think about teaching your, how you make masks, your mask making? Yeah. No, I mean, that's, it's, fairly, it, it's, it's fairly simple if you, like, if I uh, kind of show people how to do it. Um, you know, of course, I'm saying that, but, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, definitely I could. And is there anything else that you might want to get across about your art that I haven't asked you? I think we pretty much covered everything. Like I said, I just, uh, if anything, I just want people to see the passion in my work and uh, understand that uh, I love doing what I'm doing. And uh, I wanted to just show and express in my work so that people could feel that energy and that power. Because it's, it, uh, sometimes it can be overwhelming sometimes. 
for me because I'm, I'm, I got so many ideas and so many things coming at me. And then, you know, you got your regular life to live too. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it conflicts sometimes because I'm, I'm, I'm so passionate about this art thing and, you know, it, I have to live my regular life too. I can't just be, you know, this art nerd in the basement, you know, trying to create art and stuff. You know, I got to take care of my family as well. Right. It's a balancing act, right? Yes, it's, it's a big balancing act. Well, thanks for coming on tonight and telling us about your, your solo show, Ancestral Callings. I just want to let everybody know that Noah's um, exhibit will be up at Studio 5 on the first floor of the Torpedo Factory. It's on view now through October 4th. So get in and see it in person if you can. Everyone thanks you, Noah. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Thank and you all for coming tuned. out, taking the time. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.